greatness. A man must live as if he's never going to die. Chris Paul plays basketball with that same brand of courage. His attitude on the court, give me your best shot. Knock me down if you must, but know that I will get back up and I will beat you. This attitude was ignited on a slab of concrete in Louisville, North Carolina, a small dot on the map. But size only matters when measuring a man's heart. This is Chris Paul before the big. Located 15 minutes west of Winston-Salem in the upper region of the state, Louisville, in an effort to continue to retain its small town feel, incorporated in 1991 and banned fast food restaurants. The 10 square miles of two-lane roads and endless trees are home to about 13,000 residents, all of whom either know or will tell you that they know the city's favorite son. The pregnancy for Chris was a surprise. It was a shocker. We had been in our house. We moved in our house in April of 84. Chris was born in May of 85, so it was unexpected, but it was a good thing. Chris was born on May 6, 1985, to Charles and Robin Paul, their second and last child, making Chris forever the baby of what is a large, extended family. CJ, Charles Jr., is two years older than Chris, a fortunate circumstance, though it would be years before Chris would see it as such. When we were kids, everybody will tell you we, it was basically, uh, we hated each other. I mean, we fought about everything. Chris was just rough, um, mean almost, you know what I mean? Just, um, you know, even though CJ was bigger and older, uh, you know, Chris would never back down. They would always fight, you know. Chris always wanted to be with CJ. And CJ didn't always want Chris around because he was younger, but Chris didn't always understand that. I used to look at all his friends as my friends. You know, anytime my brother was going to a birthday party, to a sleepover, or hang out with his friends, I wanted to go because I felt like those were my friends too. And uh, it would hurt at times when he, you know, tell my parents, no, he's not going. Sometimes they didn't want Chris to play with him. <laughs> they was like, you too little. See, Dave's little brother, you can't play with us. So sometimes he didn't, so sometimes I had to take Chris and play with him. And we fought all day, every day. Every time we was playing basketball down the hill uh, at my house, we fought. We fought over who was going to get the front seat. We fought over who was going to eat the last sandwich or whatever, and that's, that's the way it was. It's not known if having an unyielding brother is what ultimately shaped the diminutive point guard into becoming one of the game's most lethal closers. Those closest to Chris saw evidence of his uncompromising spirit and at times emotional behavior at a very early age. One instance I remember, he was in a, a daycare and some kids tried to take his drink and I think Chris, I think Chris sent him to the doctor. Chris bit him, which was a no-no. He didn't get put out, but he did get punished. He did get punished, so yeah, that was, that was not good. I do remember one story when Chris wasn't even walking yet. He pushed me down a flight of steps. I don't know. CJ might have been three. I might have been close to one. And it's something he always brings up. I pushed him down the stairs. You know, CJ was... Obviously, I didn't know what I was doing, but I walked by the stairs and CJ was standing there and I, I pushed him down. And it started, I guess, when he came out of the womb. As the boys grew, they would need an outlet for their aggression. The lone park in Louisville wasn't near, so Charles approached the boys' youth football coach about an idea he had. He built the basketball court. We had all the neighborhood kids over there, kids, cousins, and everybody. It was the best. We had to build it. Because when, you know, if that's your love and that's what you do all the time, you know, you had to have something for you to play on. We would play until it was pitch black dark until we lost one of the balls. Well, I built the court for them so they could run down there and get the, get the ball when they rolled off, down the court off the hill. So I bought this little fishnet and put it around it. And they still, would, the ball still would bounce over. And there was a little creek down on the other side. And we kept about five balls usually, but all five would be in that creek at some point in time. Even to this day when we moved out of the old house, uh, the neighbors were like, man, we found I don't know how many basketballs down there. 
Chris would go to shoot a basket, bam, get it out of here. And it's like, you know, we sometimes we sit there and watch and we go, oh man, let them, let them shoot. You know, they never let them shoot. CJ never ever once uh, told his friends, hey man, just let them shoot. If it, wasn't one of those, if it wasn't one of those guys, it was actually CJ. Smack! I always thought he had little man's complex because he was just, he was so small. Uh, CJ didn't lighten up on Chris. Chris had to come up to him. And they'd be back there on the court playing and I would always holler, don't hurt him, don't hurt him. But every time they would knock Chris down, he'd get right back up running. The one-on-one -on -one matches always led to fights. And that's why we usually had to come in the house. Mom and Dad would hear us outside arguing or fighting. And we'd always have to come in. I think Chris early on had to figure out, man, I gotta figure out how to get this shot off. When I was always crafty, even when we were younger, I was pretty good. I was pretty good, and uh, my brother them were always bigger than me, but I wanted to play. You kind of see a little shift happening. All right, he's getting some shots off. He's making those shots. Some of these older guys are getting a little frustrated, you know. As we got older, they realized that they couldn't guard me. You know what I mean? I, I really uh, started getting better and better. And then when I went and played against my friends my own age, it was almost like a joke. Coming up next. When you're in high school, you just want to be on varsity. Everybody knows that. But I had a conversation with my dad. My dad was like, nope, you should just stay on JV. Keep playing, gain your confidence. One more year of JV helped me because I could keep working on my game instead of sitting there on varsity riding the bench. The game of basketball is like a symphony. Each position on the court, a rhythmic element in a harmonic concert. The bigs are the percussion. Implements providing the explosion. Wing players are the strings, soaring smoothly and gracefully through space. At the point is the conductor, meticulously directing each instrument. When all parts are in sync, the crowds rise in joyful appreciation. Arguably, the best conductor in today's NBA is Clippers guard Chris Paul. Chris was raised in Louisville, North Carolina, a small town off Highway 421, which when traveled eastward, cuts straight through Tobacco Road, an artery which pumps basketball blood to the rest of the nation. I had never heard of the place until Charles and Robin moved out there. There may have been only two street lights in the whole area. And we used to go, you know, over there and uh, ride bikes through the neighborhood or walk around the neighborhood. Uh, when they first moved out there, there was only maybe five, ten houses in the whole community that, that they lived in. Chris was raised in the hotbed of basketball, but early on, many close to him thought football was a better fit. I believe Chris did all his frustrations out on, on me and his mom on the football field because he used to hit people, tackle people. They thought Chris was a little rough, little rough rider. He was real good in football. Man, that kid would lay a hit and, you know, I mean, it was loud and he would just jump right back up. I mean, you know, you'd think somebody would stay down. Well, a lot of times the other guy would, but Chris would come through full speed and, and would hit Make, make a good play and jump right back up and like, let's go again. When I played Pop Warner and stuff like that, people didn't want to run through the, through the middle because they knew I was a middle linebacker and I was going to hit you. My decision to stop playing football had a lot to do with um, the fact that I spent the entire summer playing basketball. I was playing AAU basketball on my travel team, playing, playing, playing. And when I was in high school, I basically had a complex about not lifting weights because I could always shoot. Since I was little, I was always a really good shooter. And people used to say if I lifted weights, um, it would throw my shot off. And so I didn't want to lift weights, but football coach would want us in there lifting weights and I wouldn't do it. CJ and Chris's love of basketball came initially from tagging along with their father to City Games Charles played. 
Seeing his son's interest, Charles devised imaginative drills for his two sons. Every time he had a game, he took us to the gym with him. So we were just little gym rats with my dad. And then when it was time for us, he would tie our right hands behind our back, you know, make us eat with our left hand and different things like that. And then he would blindfold us so we couldn't look at the ball because most people have a tendency to want to look with it where they're dribbling. First, I started off tying their right hand behind their back. And then I started thinking, I said, okay. So I made them put their arm down inside the t-shirt where they could only use their left hand because Larry Bird was so good with his left hand. They wasn't torture or anything like that, but uh, it, definitely, um, it definitely got us a little bit more mobile. Once Chris reached West Forsyth High School, his basketball skills were years beyond those of his classmates and most everyone else his age. But an experience two years prior led his father to make a tough decision. CJ was on varsity his freshman year and I took him off because he wasn't playing. My whole thing is if you're going to be on varsity, you need to be playing. So I learned from CJ with Chris. Chris was good enough, but Chris was small. So I wanted Chris to play JV. We had practice, the JV team had practice. Once we finished, we were in the old gym. As soon as our practice was over, I would run over to the new gym um, and practice with the varsity every day. So that's what I did, practiced and then went over there. And uh, I used to kill the varsity point guard too, by the way, because my brother actually was small forward. So then got to my sophomore year, I just knew you know, I was going to play varsity. But that same point guard, he was a senior now. And the head coach, uh, Coach Layton, told me, he said, look, Chris, I can put you on varsity, but, would you, but you won't get much playing time. So, you know, when you're in high school, you just want to be on varsity. Everybody knows that. But I had a conversation with my dad. My dad was like, nope, you should just stay on JV, keep playing, gain your confidence. One more year of JV helped me because I could keep working on my game instead of sitting there on varsity riding the bench. His confidence grew even more during the summer months when he went up against elite competition playing AAU ball. It was an invaluable experience, but one which put a strain on the family. They didn't do anything for Robin and Charles. Everything was CJ and Chris. Their life was centered around their boys. And it wasn't just one of them, it was both of them. Every year that they was involved in AAU, they made it to the AAU Nationals. So my husband actually got one week a year paid vacation. So that other week he would have to take without pay and he would do whatever needed to be done, you know, to pay the bills. So if that meant, you know, going out and getting a loan or whatever, we did what we had to do. When you're a kid, you're just like, Mama, I need to go here. I need to go here. I need to do that. And they did it. Now that I think about it, man, they loved us. <laughs> they loved us and they still do. And uh, my dad spent his entire 401k on me and my brother playing um, AAU basketball. And when it happened at the time, obviously he didn't tell us, but now I understand what that means and what he did. And um, I'm grateful for it. And I'll never forget the day that I told my dad, uh, you know, that he could walk into work. And I said, you know, dad, now I'm gonna help take care of you and repay you for all the things that you did for, for me and the family. Although much of Chris's focus was on improving his game on the court, his parents never let either of their boys lose sight of the importance of education. He would do his projects, but he would wait till the last minute. I mean, it was nothing for us to have to go to Kinko's at 2 o'clock in the morning to have something um, laminated or something printed. I mean, he was going to turn it in on time, but we might not finish it until a couple of hours before it was actually due. His parents, I know, held him to a pretty high standard. I think especially, I think he got off to a not as good a start as his parents would want to when he started in high school, but he turned that around pretty quickly. Chris was very uh, involved in not just his academic work and not athletic work, but uh, he uh, ran every year to be uh, one of the class officers and then uh, he was uh, crowned the king of the prom and then in the fall they have the homecoming and so he was homecoming king as well. Back on the court, word had spread throughout the county about the short kid killing it on the junior circuit. So once he arrived on varsity, the crowds poured into the gymnasiums to see this show for themselves. It was crazy. Every game was sold out. Every last game. I don't care who they was playing. 
and it was people from all over. They started moving a few of my high school games from our high school to the Coliseum, to the to the Coliseum, so they could seat more people. And pretty, uh, pretty. It was it was jumping at the time. Never knowing what Chris might do, the crowd stayed to the end. But if the game was tight, Chris's mother rarely did. Game got close. Last five minutes, everybody in the gym would see my mom move her way through the stands and walk out. She would go into the women's bathroom or she would walk outside. I remember a few games I'd be on the free throw line and I, I'd see her. Sometimes I would have a tendency to scoot out sometimes. That might just be my potty time. Well, I had these little kids that would always come in the bathroom and they would check on the score for me back and forth, back and forth. Sometimes I'd stay in the bathroom, sometimes I would go out into the lobby. I would just be a nervous wreck until after the game. Coming up next. And I was eight years old drinking coffee. Because my granddad, every morning he woke up and he made coffee. I mean, it's the sweetest coffee ever, about eight packs of sugar. You know what I mean? So I'm, me and my brother was sitting there at 6.30 in the morning at my granddad's house, drink coffee, and we would go to work with him. I tell people all the time, my dad put the fear of God in me, you know, and I knew uh, right from wrong, and when I did, anytime I did something, I thought about my dad. I got scared, <laughs> I got scared, and sometimes people say, uh, you know, you should never fear this, but, you know, I think, to a certain extent, a, a sign of fear is also respect. Chris Paul fears little on the basketball court, but kids growing up in the South, as Chris did, learn early how to answer adults when called upon. And it is never with the one word answer. Growing up in church, uh, Christian environment, always it was yes sir, yes ma'am. I mean the old house, their bedrooms was all the way on the other side of the house. If I was in the house and they didn't know I was in the house and their mom would call them and they say yes. And I said, what'd you say? He said, yes ma'am because they knew I was in the house. You don't never get too grown to be disrespectful. And that's what I like about all of them. They are respectable. They are still, they, they are not in that nope, and yep and all that, yes and no. And if you tell one do something, do it, you know. And it's always been that way and always will be. Where I'm from, if you're walking down the street and you walk past a stranger, you're gonna speak. You're gonna acknowledge each other's existence. You're gonna say, you know, even if you don't know each other, just crossing, you're going to say, hey, how you doing? Uh, you're going to speak. And that's, that's how it was my entire, you know, childhood, and even till today. You know, if I go home, I'm going to speak to you, even if I don't know you. It's just, I don't know, it may be a Southern thing. It may be uh, where I'm from, but that's, that's how it is. And everybody, you know, is, you, is yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and stuff like that. or. My grandmother was gonna knock me in my mouth. The closeness of Chris's family was forged not through blood, but from respect and joy and sharing in each other's lives. And often that was done around basketball and food. This whole family has always been close. And we used to eat every one day a week here at the house. And the whole family would come, you know, it's just everybody just had, had a good time and cut up. It looked like every time they would come, you know, it was always on the basketball court. Sometimes it was fish, sometimes it was salmon croquettes, sometimes it was pork chop, pinto beans, uh, slaw, potato salad. Thursday night dinners would be beans and minis and tuna. It is so, I mean, we really like it. You have to know what it is. It's not all mixed up together either, okay? Well, I've always said that I feel so fortunate and blessed to, to have the family that I do. And my family is not perfect by any means. Just like any other family, we do have issues and, and things like that. But I know for a fact that I have the best family that there is in the world because my parents, uh, my mom and my dad, they met at church, you know, and. So my entire childhood, my entire family, all we all went to the same church. So for me, 
at the end of the day, this ball is going to stop bouncing one day and, you know, the fans may love you, they may not. But one thing about my family is they're always going to be there. Being raised in a small town in the South is radically different than growing up in a large metropolitan area such as Southern California. Manners are drilled into you from the moment you can string two words together. Where Chris is from, they don't care if a man is poor. If he has family, then he is rich. Chris and his brother CJ were fortunate to have many role models, but perhaps none more important than their Papa Chili, Nathaniel Jones. My dad owned a service station. He was the first black owned in North Carolina. And I grew up working at the service station. My mom worked at the service station, my sister worked at the service station. And he made sure we knew the value of working and what it meant and how hard, he let us know how hard it took for him to get where he was, you know. But he was, he gave back, he made sure he took care of everybody, if he could. But he, you didn't go up there to play. He didn't, he didn't play that type of games. You went up there to work. That was the boys' summer job. They had a love-hate relationship with it. They hated being out there because it was hot, but they loved being out there because they was with Papa, and he did, he gave them whatever they wanted, and he paid them good. And I was eight years old drinking coffee, because my granddad, every morning, he woke up and he made coffee. I mean, it's the sweetest coffee ever, about eight packs of sugar. You know what I mean? So I'm, me and my brother was sitting there at 6.30 in the morning in my granddad's house, drink coffee, and we would go to work with him, 7, 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. We were out there in the hot sun at the service station learning how to rotate tires, uh, pump gas, change oil. It was hard for my granddad to have us both out there because we were to, it was like a competition. Who could get the most tip money? Me and my brother, as we grew up, people would pull up to the self-service, but we would run out to the cars before they get out and say, no, let me pump it. That way we could try to get tips. So then that would always, if, if I felt like I was out there first, and he thought he was out there first, it would lead to a fight usually. That same fire drove Chris on the basketball court. After two years playing the opening act on the JV team, Chris shined in the leading role, drawing national attention and elite coaches from across the country to his games. Then you hear the rumble. Well, there's the coach for NC State, or there's the coach for this college, or that college. During that year or two, the phone was constantly ringing. The mailbox was always full. It was just unbelievable. Then I would talk to Charles, and you know, he would tell me, uh, you know, well, this coach, you know, contacted us, or we got a letter from this school, and so you knew then, all right, this dude's gonna play D1 basketball. He was not getting recruited by. Carolina, and he was a Carolina fan back then, but they already had the point guard that they needed. And um, once he took that visit over to Wake Forest, they swept him off his feet. It was skip process, really. It really was skip. But when we was looking at the different schools, me and Robin, we were sold at Wake. You know, and you always talk about academics. It was academics before basketball. It wasn't basketball then academics. Skip kept on telling us, I guarantee you when you graduate from Wake Forest that you will have a great education and you will have relationships that go beyond basketball. Well, everyone was saying he was special, you know, and not just on the court, but off the court. And I think that's what really attracted uh, Coach Prosser, who was the head coach at the time, to Chris. You know, there's very few kids who are the total package, you know, great players, but also can represent the school in a way that we wanted and um, just be great in the community and just be kind of the face of Wake Forest basketball. So we had a lot of a lot of visions for Chris that went beyond basketball. He had just about everything to do with it. Um, a lot of the coaches that recruited me were great coaches, but he was an even better person. He made me feel like he really cared about me. He really did. Um, we just made a bond that quick. Chris had grown up a fan of Tar Heel Blue, but Matt Darty, before being relieved as head coach on April 1st in 2003, had only shown casual interest. By the time Roy Williams was named to replace him, it was too late. On May 4th or 5th, Carolina finally did come back and offer me a scholarship. They offered me a scholarship, and so that's why I sort of waited. I waited until they offered me a scholarship that way I knew that I could have went to Carolina if I wanted to. Uh, and then I went ahead and committed to Wake. 
Coming up. It was it was crazy that night, you know, I'm asking why, you know, I mean, I'm looking at my mom, my mom is tore up because my mom had already lost her mom, my grandmother, so uh, it was tough. It was tough for a long time. For a long time, it was tough. A best friend? Usually a classmate, a teammate, or maybe even a next door neighbor. Nope, not for me. My best friend was the heart and soul of my family. Standing six foot two inches tall, he was a man to be feared. Not because he was a dangerous man or a mean man, but because he could easily kill you with his charm and kindness. Chris Paul wrote this letter about his grandfather for a class assignment while attending Wake Forest University. On May 6th, his 17th birthday, Chris verbally committed to play college basketball for the Demon Deacons. That following fall, just before his senior season was set to begin, with family in attendance, Chris signed his letter of intent to wake, perhaps the greatest moment in his young life, accepting a college scholarship to play basketball where his family and friends could continue to watch and support him. But if November 14, 2002 was his best day, then November 15th was certainly his worst. My family was there, a bunch of classmates was there, and as soon as I signed the letter, my grandfather had a Wake hat on, and he came and handed it to me, and I put it on. And uh, that night, Wake Forest uh, had a basketball game, so me and my granddad went to go see their basketball My dad was getting ready to have some work done to the house. A painter, my sister had lined up a painter to come meet him to give him an estimate. And I talked to my dad, what, four, five, six times a day, every day. But then we kept trying to get in touch with my dad. We couldn't get in touch with him. And that's not like him because he would always call me when he get, get, got home, call my sister and this, that, and the other. So I called Charles. And I told Charles to go. So Charles went over there, and he actually was behind the ambulance. And when he, was, when he got there, he... Um, he called, and I was like, is everything okay? And he just broke down, he said no. Watching my but phone rings, and my brother, and my brother was at school. So my brother was like, Chris, what you doing? I was like, nothing, I'm at the game. I was like, what you doing? He was like, I'm driving home. He was like, uh, Papa sick. I was like, what? He said, yeah, mama done said Papa sick, so I'm driving home. And now I get worried, because my brother don't come home. Not that far of a drive, not after you just left, after I signed my letter of intent. As I'm running to the car, I see one of my cousins, Jeff, and he stops me and grabs me and says, they killed him. And I was stuck, like, what? He said, uh, they murdered him, and I said, who, what? And that's how I found out. We got in the car, rode by, and I saw my grandfather there laying in the carport. My best friend was the owner of the only black owned service station in North Carolina. He taught me how to hold on, be strong, and never, never let someone tell me that I was either too short, too small, or even too dark to do something. It was just a terrible nightmare. I pray that nobody else ever has to go through that. It was five teenage boys that had murder, murdered my dad over money. I mean, they didn't even get Holly any, um, if they got any. And my dad was the type of person, if you asked him for something, he would give it to you. Angry, angry. That night I was angry and my family was angry like like I said everybody knew my grandfather and everybody knew my family so my first thing was all right somebody know what happened let's find out and let's fix this it affected everybody not just the immediate family but the surrounding families and it was it was a hard thing to deal with at the time and still a lot of people hadn't really gotten over it.
at that point, my dad was Chris's best friend because CJ had went off to school. So him and my dad would go out to eat together sometimes. You know, my dad would come out to our house a lot. But sometimes him and Chris would just go out to eat or Chris would go run errands for him when he got out of school. See, my best friend taught me more than just how to dribble a round ball. He taught me how to pump gas without going over the dollar at age seven. He even taught me that when I find my wife, that she should be just like my mother. He taught me how to love and how to sacrifice. He taught me how to forgive and how to forget. But most of all, he taught me the importance of integrity and how my character will take me farther in life than any talent ever will. So on the 19th was my granddad's funeral. So that was the toughest day too. Um, the Wake Forest team, which I wasn't even at Wake yet, they came to the funeral and the whole city, everything. So we buried my grandfather on the 19th and the 20th was the first game of my senior year. And before I walked out the door, I mentioned something about honoring my granddad and uh, my aunt was like, why not? I said, well, just go and hit 61 points. And he was like, wow, 61? That would be a good idea, but that's a lot of points, auntie. I said, you're right, but go ahead. You know, but we thought nothing else about it and we laughed it off and, you know, I said, play good, have a good game, see you in a few. Nobody thought he could really do it. That's a lot of points to score. Especially a person like Chris, who's very unselfish. And he came ready to play. He wasn't moping. He wasn't. He was like, I'm going to do this. Probably when he was at about 55, 56 points, people, that rumor started in the stands that he was trying to get to 61. And when he hit that 61, he got the 61, he made a layup, and hit 61 points. And then he, went to, he got fouled, went to the free throw line, threw it out of bounds, and then he just broke down. He just looked like he was limp, and then when he came over, he just fell in my arms, and then we just cried, my wife came down, and all us just, you know, we was crying, and the crowd was hollering CP3, so. Words cannot explain what was happening. I think for me, it just felt like, uh, like I was a kid, too. You know, I was, 16 years old, something like that, 16, 17 years old, and it felt like just everything was right in the world, like I had accomplished everything that I needed to accomplish on earth right then and there. You know, I never knew about the NBA at the time, it was that I would play in the NBA at the time, it was, that was the greatest feat that I would ever conquer, and I was done. My best friend goes by the name of Nathaniel Frederick Jones, also known to his grandchildren as Papa Chili. We didn't go out to parties, and we never threw eggs at cars, but me and my grandfather shared some of the most memorable times together. In the 17 years I was blessed to have him at my side, he taught me more about life than I could ever learn with a PhD. To him, life was a gift that should be cherished and used very wisely because tomorrow is never promised. Oh, my best friend, I would never, ever trade him for the world. On a cold, windy night on the 13th of November, 2003, I felt the presence of my best friend once again. Standing in the old, beat-up locker room of the Herald of Madison Square Garden, I began to put on my brand new, heavily white uniform with the capitalized letters of P-A-U-L on my back for the very first time. A bittersweet feeling it was, which brought tears to my eyes as I began to realize that my best friend would be missing from the first game of my collegiate career that he had made possible. The more I thought about it, the more and more tears streamed down my face. While crying, the only thing I could hear was my best friend's voice saying, be strong and play your heart out. Almost one year to the date that his grandfather, his best friend, was murdered, Chris Paul played his first game 
for Wake Forest. In that letter which he wrote for that class assignment, Chris recalled how his grandfather used to tell him to remain vigilant. On that night at Madison Square Garden in New York, with a heavy heart, Chris took the floor and led the Demon Deacons to a victory over Memphis. Wake Forest would win its first 11 games in 2003. I remember his first game being in Madison Square Garden, um, and they put him in as the starter. And I was literally sick on the stunt. Like, oh my God, they're gonna start in his first game. Oh. And he does a really good job. And I'm like, okay, you know, we can breathe a little bit. This kid is as good as everybody says he is. Because at that point, you start to hear the hype. You start to hear people talk about him. But again, to us, he's Chris. Wake was the defending ACC regular season champion when Chris arrived on campus. And so, in an attempt to fit in, Chris often played the role of the facilitator. He was very, very, very unselfish, almost to a fault. And I just remember, you know, we were playing someone and he was passing up shots and he was, you know, and I said, and I called him in the office and I said, Chris, I said, you know, we need you to play aggressively. We need you to play like, like you can play. And he said, Coach, well, you know, you guys won without me last year and I'm just trying to fit in. And I said, Chris, we, we need you to score more. We need you to be more aggressive. Um, I think the next night he goes out and gets 30 something. He comes back in my office and said, Coach, is that what you need? And I said, Yeah. You know, I was a McDonald's All American, but when I got to college, you know, I wasn't the best player, not initially. And my coaches still never used to tell me that I was this good or anything like that because I always had to be, you know, a little bit reserved because I had upperclassmen who had been there before I got there. And they knew I was coming. This was my hometown. And, I always had to make sure I wasn't stepping on anybody's toes. One month later, Wake traveled to Chapel Hill to face the fourth-ranked Tar Heels in Roy Williams' first ACC game, and it's still talked about today as probably the greatest ever in this historic Tobacco Road rivalry. I'm still tired from the game. <laughs> now it was a great game. It's an instant classic. Wow, Carolina! I'm in Carolina. And we playing them, and uh, man, it was just back and forth, back and forth. Rashad McCants and Raymond Felt and all these boys that we seen coming up playing ball. He and Raymond Felt went at it. And I would vouch to say, and Chris, forgive me, don't get mad at me, but Raymond Felt probably got the best of him that first quarter. Um, but Chris being the guy he was, you could tell he he was like, you know what, not, not, not the next half. I just remember the energy. And I was a little bit nervous just because, you know, I felt like it got so loud in that game at one point that I couldn't hear anything. And I was just nervous. And I think that game there helped me deal with nerves. A sellout crowd of almost 22,000 witnessed a cross between a basketball game and an indoor track meet. The Tar Heels entered the game averaging 88 points. The 17th ranked Deacons just won less. But what occurred on this night left even the fans gasping for air. A remarkable 13 players finished in double digits in a thrilling 119 to 114 triple overtime wake victory. Coach Skip Prosser would later say, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never seen anything quite like that. The 233 combined points fell one shy of the most ever between ACC foes. Chris played 46 minutes, finishing with 18 points, 8 assists, and 5 steals. It'll go down as one of the greatest games, not only in Wake Forest history, but probably ACC basketball history. In that game alone, there was so many pros on the floor that night, and, and you know, he just kind of, you know, held his own and, and, and carried us and, and just did a lot of special things on the floor. Wake finished tied for third in the ACC in Chris's freshman season and won two games in the NCAA tournament before losing in the Sweet 16 to Jameer Nelson and top-seeded St. Joe's. Chris hit just two of six shots in that game, while Nelson tallied a team-high 24 points. And Jameer Nelson was physically stronger than Chris, and probably got the better of Chris. And, um, you know, and I said to myself, you know, I'm making mental notes about what he's got to work on for the next year, and, you know, one of the things that I had mentally had was he had to get physically stronger. Well, you know, the next day he had already come in my office and said, Coach, you don't have to say anything. I, I, I know, that'll never happen again. You know, I gotta get bigger, stronger. I'll never get physically pushed around again. Wake returned every scholarship player from that team and entered the 2004 season number two in the preseason polls. 
Behind Chris's leadership, they finished 13-3 in conference, just one game behind UNC. After every game, he'd come in and coach, let's watch tape, let's watch film. He'd wait for me after the games the next morning. He'd be in my office. And he never wanted to see what he did well. He always wanted to see his bad plays so he could get better. I think that's, that's what separates him a little bit. He's such a student of the game, and he's, so, uh, he's a step ahead. Um, he just gets it. Wake earned a number two seed in the NCAA tournament that year, and in defeating Chattanooga in the first round, established a new school record with 27 wins. But in the second round, Cinderella appeared in the form of the West Virginia Mountaineers. The game would go two overtimes. Chris scored 10 in the first OT, but fouled out in the second. The 111 to 105 loss stung, and not even being named a first team All-American would help ease that pain. And now, with the season over, people started to ask what might be next for Chris. We weren't ready for him to go his freshman year. Second year was still tough. You know, with Skip being so positive and Wake doing so good, and you know, everybody just like, man, Wake Forest basketball is back. And you know, Chris was a major part of it. So we was, you know, torn in between, but we let the final decision come to him. You know, I just want to make sure he was sure about what he was doing. The whole process was you know, with him and his family, and we just said, hey, look, we're here. Um, if you need us for advice or whatever, that kind of thing. And um, our whole thing was, the whole time, was we want what's best for you. The decision to leave weighed heavily on Chris because of his feelings for Wake Forest University and most especially his love for Coach Prosser. You know, I always say this, and it's crazy, but, uh, you know, it's been my dad, uh, obviously my grandfather, you know, and Coach Prosser is one of those guys who, it's crazy, I only played for him for two years, but I committed to Wake as a junior in high school, so I was actually, you know, four years it felt like I played for him, but uh, it's so much stuff that he said that is instilled into me daily. Like, one of the craziest things, I used to come in his office and he'd be like, uh, Chris, how you doing today? And I'd be like, I'm good, coach. He'd be like, you're well, you're well, and it's funny, even still to this day, you know, I make sure I say I'm well, I'm not, I'm good, you know, and I correct people when they say it. And it's a lot of different things. He used to say never delay gratitude, you know, and those are little sayings that he would say before practice that just stuck with me. And, you know, integrity is everything. And there are times when I contemplate on doing this or doing that and I think about maybe what coach said or the fact that he's looking because he always held me accountable for everything that I did. In the summer of 2007, two years after Chris had left for the NBA, George Skip Prosser died of a heart attack while on the Wake Forest campus. Prosser was a relentless reader of biographies, history, philosophy. His favorite quote he once said was from Ralph Waldo Emerson, our chief want in life is someone who will make us do what we can. Uh, he was devastated, you know, he, was, he just couldn't believe it. And, um, you know, like I said, he, you know, he, he, he lost another influential, influential person in his life. Um, he knew, you know, he had voiced it that he wouldn't be where he was, you know, at that time without Coach Prosser. And so, you know, it was tough on him. You know, it, it, was, it was really tough on him. And, um, you know, I know he, even to this day, I think, you know, even with the shoes and, you know, he, he put Coach's name on the shoes and, and that kind of thing. So I know he's always going to be a part of Chris's life. Coming up next, I'm on the court, um, I'm just lightweight crazy, you know, and that's just the competitiveness to want to win and want to succeed and want my teammates to succeed and everybody who's with me and a part of everything that I'm doing to succeed. And then after the game is over, I realized that it was a game. He would get mad at me because I would say he wasn't six foot when he was here. And he'd say, Coach, I'm six foot, I might be six one, you know? So he has little man syndrome, so they always have a, a chip on their shoulders. You know, he used that as fuel and motivation to, you know, overcome all that. It's funny, me being, um, you know, I always say vertically challenged my entire life. It, it has benefited me in, in ways. Obviously, I've always wanted to be able to drive and just dunk on a group of people, you know, but. To, to my advantage, 
um, always somewhat being an underdog and having people tower over me. It's helped me be creative and knowing how to get the ball over here or not just always come up right here to shoot the ball and bring it over here and all these different trick shots and it's fun. It's fun and sometimes when I'm in the game, you know, it may be a minute and 30 seconds left in a tied game, crowd going nuts. It, it does feel like I'm in the backyard or I'm at the YMCA back home playing with my boys and it's a shot that I know that in the game it goes in, everybody's gonna go nuts. Like, man, how in the world did he pull that off? You know, but it's a shot that I've been doing since I was little. Maybe what amazes us, inspires us about Chris Paul is that even at his size, he continues time and time again to dominate other players on the court. Malcolm Gladwell's best-selling book, Outliers, theorize that to become very successful at something, you need to spend 10,000 hours perfecting it. And on those small courts, behind those homes in Louisville, North Carolina, that's exactly what Chris did. But talent without purpose rarely succeeds. On the court, um, I'm just lightweight crazy, you know, and that's just the competitiveness to want to win and want to succeed and want my teammates to succeed and everybody who's with me and a part of everything that I'm doing to succeed. And then after the game is over, I realized that it was a game. It was a game and I've, I've grown as, as not only a player on the court, but as a person. And I put everything into perspective and I think my dad helps me with all of that stuff. You know, and that I've always had a great role model, you know, from my dad as, you know, it sounds pretty cliche, but treat people the way you want to be treated. And I think when, when the game is over, you know, I'm blessed and fortunate to live the life that I do and to be surrounded around, around the the people that I am, and I don't take it for granted, you know, and I just try to enjoy it. That life became significantly more enjoyable after a chance meeting at a basketball game in Winston-Salem. He was such a polite person, and that's rare, especially somebody so young. So, and he had such a huge family, like he was with his entire family. It was kind of intimidating at first, but it was really nice, refreshing. We've been together since my freshman year in college, her sophomore year, so. You just sort of know, and for me, growing up, um, my mom, I was a baby boy, so my mom, you know, she wasn't too crazy about any woman, you know, so I never brought a girl home before, anything like that. You know, if you meet my parents, then it must be pretty seri serious, you know, and I, I brought Jada home, I met her family, she met my family, and um, she was just real. She liked me for who I was. She was from my hometown, so uh, it's funny. We, we've grown together. Having her by my side through all this stuff, we've been able to appreciate everything together. Jada attended UNC Charlotte, but spent most moments, when not in class, over at Wake with Chris. And it was their time on campus which inspired Chris's surprise proposal. I had no idea he was going to propose and I'm usually pretty nosy and kind of on top of things because Chris is terrible at keeping secrets but he got me with this one. She's very, I don't know, inquisitive, always want to know what's going on so I actually called Coach Battle who was my assistant coach when I was at Wake, you know, while I was in the car with her so she'd think that, you know, Wake was really having a meeting over there at the arena and I just thought that's the first, uh, that's the place where we met for the first time. So we get to the school, we pull up in the back parking lot, and there are no other cars there. And I'm like, this is weird. Again, I'm thinking, he's like, oh, everybody must have parked in the front. And I'm like, okay, you know. So we walk into the back door of the arena, all the lights are on, but I don't hear anything. Usually it's always like kind of buzz around the, around the Coliseum. So I'm like, there's nobody here. And he's like, oh, let's just keep going. So we walk up to the main concourse, and he starts to walk down the stairs, and like, with this empty basketball court, I'm like, what is going on? And he turns around, he gets on one knee, and I'm, I don't know what he said after that, because I kind of zoned out. It was where we first met at the holiday tournament, at the basketball game. Chris was selected by the New Orleans Hornets with the third pick of the 2005 NBA Draft. He would win the Rookie of the Year award, and three years later, lead the NBA in both assists and steals, guiding the Hornets to their first ever division crown. On December 8, 2011, the Lakers thought they had traded for Chris, 
But after the league nixed the deal, the Clippers snapped him up four days later. And it's been an emotional roller coaster. That's, that's behind me now, and this is where I am. And this is where I'm, I'm happy to be. So everything now is all about uh, what, what can we do here to uh, get the Clippers uh, a championship here in L.A. And that's, that's my mind state. It was a whirlwind week for the Pauls who have now settled into a new lifestyle in Los Angeles while welcoming in a new member to their growing family. I love it here. I didn't think I was going through. It's very refreshing. The people are really nice and the traffic is, I mean, it's, you can't do anything about it. You know what I mean? So I almost have to accept it. Um, the only complaint is that it's so far from home. But, you know, we can talk about Red Eye. We're home in three and a half hours, four hours. To have kids, um, anyway, you know, puts everything into perspective and it really makes you so selfless. Like, I remember when my son was born, it made me drive slower. You know, it made me just realize that it's not about me. You know, because when you're just living day to day and it's just you, it's like, I got to live for me. But I always think about it now, you know, I'm, I'm living for them. You know, I, it would be pretty selfish for me to do anything to, to not be there for my kids. And it was one thing with my son, it's easy, he fall down, get up, you know. It's so easy to be rough with him. But now to have a daughter, it's amazing. You know, I, I almost get upset when I hear her cry and stuff like that. But um, it's, it's, it's life. You know, you change, you adapt, and you know, some things make you change for the better. He's like putty when she's around, you know what I mean? Like he's always holding her. Well, of course he's rough with little Chris. They wrestle and they fight and it's kind of crazy. I can see when, as Cameron gets older, it's going to be a whole different ball game. He's a softie when it comes to her. Remember the battles Chris and his brother CJ had as kids? Well today, though still combative when in competition, those two are the best of friends. It wasn't until I went away to college, I think, um, when we got close, because when you see each other every day, you know, you just get tired of each other, basically. So once I went away to college, that's when we got close, because we didn't really get to see each other, because I was five hours from home and playing basketball, so I never really got to come home. I'm one of two. It's just me and CJ. I've always been just me and CJ. When he went away to college, I never forget when we dropped him off at his dorm to Hampton. And when we rode four hours back to uh, North Carolina from Virginia, I sat in the back of our minivan and had my head against the window and I was crying. I was crying because even though this is a guy who I fought with day in and day out, I was going to miss him. Chris Paul is the sum of many parts. An older brother who never gave an inch parents and relatives who showed him unconditional love and support but also expected obedience. A small hometown which provided a safe environment allowing him to explore his creativity. A grandfather, Nathaniel, who in life gave him hope, in death a purpose. And that purpose has now grown from basketball prodigy to NBA all-star to husband and now a father. My son goes to school um, and this is where I'm selfish, and I'm okay with that because sometimes you have to be selfish. And a lot of kids don't go to the games on school nights because they have to get up the next morning. And then my wife had that conversation this summer, but I told her I can't do it. Like that's if if there's one thing that I get to choose and be selfish about, it's about the fact that when my game is over, I need to see Chris. I need to see my son. Win or lose, I want to see him. You know, and there may come a point in time where the games are too late and stuff like that, but that's what brings me back down. I remember when he was a baby and not even old enough uh, to know what was going on. After the game was over, we may lose, but he doesn't know it. He didn't know it. Now he knows it, and he's the first one to come tell me, Daddy, you lost tonight. You know, so that's all good and well. But, uh...